Hey, Joe here from the future. I just wanted to profess that this video assumes you've read the accompanying blog post, link in the description. But if you haven't, I also discuss the concept in the recap at the end. Quick TLDR if you're watching the video first, I make the case for not using big prescriptive prompt when working with AI agent. I prefer a two loop approach where I start iterating on the feature and then I iterate on the code itself. I've added chapters in the description if you prefer to jump straight to the recap. Don't worry, I won't tell past Joe. Hello, I wanted to show what the double loop flow looks like in practice. This is actually my second attempt recording it. The first one, I picked something just a tad too big and ended up with an hour and a half long video. I'm going to bring you in this new app I'm building for my family, something much smaller, and hopefully it's going to keep the video a bit shorter. So I'm building a card game. It's Kaiser. We call it Joffre in French. Right now, I don't have much. The feature is going to be to allow players to invite other people to games. I think we're going to start with the ability to create games, password protected or not, and join game through codes and password of different games is password protected. Currently, I do not think that there's a way for users to see their games. There's no game show page. I would like users that create games to be able to invite other players. I want them to be able to join games using a game code. So when a game is created, a game needs a game code. Very similar to how users have codes to send friends invite. I want games to be optionally password protected and I want to be able to see who is in the game on the game show page. All right, so that should be enough. We're just going to let the agent work on this for a little bit. That might take a while. I might fast forward here, but um, yeah. Okay, looks like it's done. So we're going to ask it to start a rail server. So here we're in the first loop. The first loop, we only really care about product. I'm gonna sign in, not even looking at the code right now. Already I noticed there's no way to see the games that are started. I'm gonna tell it that. There's no way to see my existing games. I'm gonna try to join a game that Alice is gonna start. My super game. I got a game code and it works. A couple of issues, there's no back button. There's no way you see my games that's coming we told them there's no way to password protect a game we're just gonna wait for it to finish working okay looks like it's done if it did what we want so now i can see my games and yeah i have all my games here i can see i'm the owner if i go do the same thing with bob smith it's the other player my games i can see i'm in one game but i am not the owner that looks Close to what we want. I can't quit or kick someone else from a game that will come with a separate PR. I try to keep the PR very narrow in scope. Right now we're just joining game using a code and a password. There's no way for me to password protect a game. Okay, it did create the back button by itself. I didn't ask for it, but I was about to. That's pretty good. Okay, so if I want to create another game, let's create it with this player instead. My super game two, let's do this. Okay, now I want to join this game here. With this player, oh, I can join the game. That's good. There's no back button on game. I would like a button to return to the dashboard from a game. Okay, so back to dashboard. New game, let's create a game, make sure it still works without a password. Yeah, that works. I want to test what would happen if I try to join with more than four users. Here, I just tested if I have a password entered, but the game doesn't have a password. It just works anyway. I guess it's not really a bug. It's maybe it's better that way. All right, let's join the game with the last user. Still works. All right, now this player should not be allowed to join. Yeah, game is full. Perfect. Okay, that's what we want. At this point, that would be the end of the first loop. We've done a bit of iteration on the feature. I have something I'm happy with. It's small enough in scope, yet it's a real feature. It's something that moved the product forward. I'm gonna ask it, open a PR. There you go. It just created a PR, gives us a link that we can open. Also gives us a joke. Why did the game developer go broke? Because he used up all his cash. Ha ha ha. Okay, we're gonna start the second loop. Here it pulls the game, that's not too bad for the current user, the game index. Game save redirects to game. I do not like having strings directly like this in code. I like to extract all my copy and have it into localization file, whether the app is gonna be translated or not. It allows me to do a bunch of cool tricks, which I'm gonna keep for another blog post because it's gonna take a while. But yeah, I do not like having copy like this. The way I reprompt, I tend to keep it vague. I copy a line and it's able to figure out 
where it is. I'm going to say, you should use a success message helper that lives in the concerns for controllers. Make sure to change it to for all the other actions in the controller. While it is working on this, I'll keep reviewing the PR. Here, game show is okay. I like to keep my controllers resourceful, meaning they only have the default Rails action, index, new, create, show, edit, update, destroy. Instead of having more action per controller, I prefer to have more controllers. Oops, let me just unblock here. Let's see what they do first. Join is probably just a get view. Perform join is going to be the post. I'll just quickly read the meta before I ask the agent to change it. So find a game by code, processable. Oh, password digest. It made it really secure for just a game that's going to be open for maybe five minutes. All right, already I noticed a couple things I do not like with this file. One, it should not have created actions. It should have used resourceful route. So create more controllers instead. Two, I do not want validation inside of controllers. Here, for example, player count higher than four. This should really live in the model. It should use instead of this, it should use the active model validation and just return an error based on that. I just want to give you an idea of the schema so that what I'm about to do makes sense to you too. There's a model called games and there's a model called users. And what ties a user to a game is a model called players. So basically joining a game is creating players. So I think there should be a controller games slash players that let user join a game. So I'm going to prompt now, just like I said, I copy paste sometimes from the code just so that I have an idea of what I'm talking about. I do not like additional method. I want to keep my controllers resourceful. So the default rails route do not add custom actions. We're going to need another controller. I think the controller should be players namespace to games. Okay, then the other thing, I also do not want to have validation inside controllers. All validation should live inside the model. So things like this, I'll just copy paste, should not live in the controller, it should live inside of the model. Use the active record validation for error management. That's good enough. We're gonna refresh, see the changes that we have already. Here, yeah, you see, that's what I meant. I do not want these strings. I want to use my helper here. Let's keep going because it's working on this file. Here I have game validation. Okay. This doesn't need necessarily a high level of security. I want it to be easy for players. If I want to get rid of the minimum six. I'll do that right now. Do not have a minimum length for game passwords. Let's keep reading while it's working on this. This is okay. Game any game list. This is okay. It should probably have some sorting of the users. I'll ignore it for now. It's only four users. I guess it doesn't really matter. Oh, wow. Is that a bat? That's something. Okay, this is much better. This is much closer to what a Rails controller should look like. There's absolutely no validation or happening inside a controller. Everything is down in the model. So I'm going to call this done. Now we've added a couple thing here. So it reopened the file. Game not full, correct password on create. Game not full, correct password. I don't know why it insists on putting it on base. Actually, I do know why people do this online. I think this is bad. I really do not like having stuff on base. Let's just put it on game. It could be password invalid. It's very close though. I'm gonna scan quick. Password, password confirmation. Player is new. Yeah, this is the style I like. I do not like having route helper. I prefer this. But he still use the route helper for absolutely no reasons. Let me paste that here. Do you need to set the URL with the route helper? The model should suffice. Let's refresh, let's go back up. Okay, model, local true. Why local? It's, it's picking up from stuff online. I do not like this. Okay, here form model. We did a lot of changes, so it's important that we check that this still works. So now let's just do a quick check. It does not bring me to the game. Let's try test game, all caps make sure that we find it correct password create it it does not create it 422 fetch response payload tells me absolutely nothing that's not cool i'm gonna try to have it use puppeteer to test so that it validates that the feature works before it says that it's done i am not able to create a game with a password you can try using puppeteer on port 3001 when you do this it prompts it to try with puppeteer and then usually it validates that the feature works before just being done like what it did here i find that it hallucinate a lot less see here what it's doing it's putting debug print when you close the loop with something like puppeteer it's able to add things in the loop so that it gains more information every time it runs it just like you would with a debugger and breakpoints. Yeah, it works. 
So I think we're done with the feature. We're gonna wait for it to push and then we're gonna do one last review pass and I'll be it. Don't you hate it hitting the limit for auto compact like 30 seconds before you're done with a feature? It's been trying to compact the conversation for like 10 minutes. I'll just kill it. We're gonna restart it. I think it's gonna be much faster. So I'm just gonna tell it run test and lint and static analysis, then push everything. Cool, it's finished. So we can click merge. So that is it, our feature is merged. We can now start games, invite people to games. They can be password protected. That's how we run the two loops. If you remember the first loop where we were iterating only on a product, I only cared about does the feature looks right to me. I keep the scope very narrow. You notice there's a bunch of other things I could have added, for example, kicking people out of a game, but I rather have a narrow scope and I have a bunch of agent work in parallel. When we're done with the first loop, we start the second loop, which is a little bit big here, but then I start being picky with the code. And as it goes, it has more of what I want correct. And I start to review less and less file and we start to spiral in towards a completed feature. That graph is a bit of a mess, but here you have it. The first loop, like I described in the posts, where you iterate on the feature, AKA vibe coding. And then after that, you just spiral toward whatever your favorite shade of teal is for the shed. At this point, you can be as picky as you want. You never have to pick the keyboard and write the thing yourself. When it's going to do changes, it's going to break a bunch of tests. It's going to figure that out and it's going to go back and fix what needs to be fixed. Sometimes I'll get it wrong and you have to reprompt it again. But this all happens async. You're able to work on something else where it's doing that. It will break things, but it's going to figure it out. And it's not like you're not designing the feature or ignoring code quality. With the second loop, you're very much focused on what the code looks like in the end, but you did not have have to go code it yourself. It makes it so that your attention is focused on a couple key moments in the interaction instead of having your attention being required for the whole flow. It reduces decision fatigue a lot. Models are pretty dumb. If you try to design your whole app and be as prescriptive as you want, the model will mess up. Even if you try to prevent all the possibilities. If you tell it not to do something, there's a good chance it's gonna do it anyway. Instead of spending a lot of time building a roadmap for it, iterate bit by bit towards what you want. Yes, it will feel dumb and it's gonna make more mistake, but I bet in the end you're gonna save time. If you just watch the agent work while it do dumb stuff, yes, you're gonna, you're gonna feel like you're wasting your time. But if you work in a way that's more async, if you just launch it and you go do something else or you start more of them, then you start to reclaim some of that time. And by keeping things small, by just iterating your way there instead of having to plan the whole thing, you're nimble, you're flexible. When you spend a lot of time on a prompt and it still does a mistake, your time investment was much higher. When model change and all of a sudden the way you prompt changes a bunch because the model is more or less susceptible to change a bunch of other things in the file or it's better as following instruction. By keeping your prompt small, by iterating instead of being super prescriptive, you keep your flexibility, you keep your time investment low and I think it will allow you to paralyze more. Yes, if you have a PRD that's very descriptive, it gets easier to give tasks to multiple models at once. But the time that you spend building a PRD level abstraction is not parallelizable. And if you do it the way I'm doing it, with a feature loop slash vibe coding, you're able to pivot while you're building the feature. It's much easier to change course if you haven't designed the whole thing ahead of time. Very often while I'm building the feature, I realize, oh, that's not really what I want. And with coding agents, the cost of pivoting is much lower. Everything is like a spike. It's like the cost of spike just went to zero. I had to redo this video. I've done it the first time because while I was building the feature, I just pivoted two or three times. I just, I was discovering what I want with the model and it made the video way too complicated to follow. So I had to redo the whole thing with a feature that's much simpler, you might be looking at a feature we built here and think, yeah, I could have designed a PRD in much less time than it took to vibe code it. And like, yeah, sure. But when it's something bigger, there's a good chance that when you're able to play with it, you're going to want to alter the direction a little bit. And this feature focus loop allows to do this. It keeps you nimble. It's not unlike doing agile versus waterfall. And I know the model would do dumb stuff. What I'm arguing is they will do dumb stuff anyway. Maybe they'll do a bunch less, but I do not think that I'm trying to twist our mind to think of all the things that could go bad with the model is a good use over time. I think you might as well code the product yourself. Do you want to be an assistant to the LLM or do you want the LLM to be an assistant to you? The way I use it, 
is a bit like it's my assistant that's writing the code and I tell it what I want it to write. It is slower than me, so I have to do a bunch of other stuff in parallel, but I do not have it do the whole thinking. I think they're not good at that. The reason why you have to write those big prescriptive prompt is because the agents are dumb. And there's ways around that. Just keep the scope narrow and iterate your way there. You won't have to forecast the whole tree of decision of where things could go wrong and try to put things in your prompt and agent files to make sure that it doesn't hit a dead end or doesn't get stuck in a loop. If it gets stuck in a loop on a feature that's very small, like, well, so be it. Just call it and start another one. And it's usually much easier to have it pivot instead of being stuck in a loop when it doesn't have a huge context. When you give it a huge context, you really pigeonhole the model into a path. I'm not gonna lie, it is still very frustrating trading at time, but when it does something dumb, my time investment is low. Anyhow, if I haven't convinced you yet, it's never gonna happen. I have the sun now straight in my eyes. I think it's time for me to stop. But think about it. If you follow this, you get to vibe code and paint the shed the exact shade of teal that you want. I'm gonna paint mine a quashifal. What do you think? I was done and then I hit like a rate limit and right now I'm waiting.